everybody hear me up there? <clears throat> um, attendance seems kind of sparse today, so uh, <clears throat> let's, uh, let's take attendance. <laughs> it's always a good uh, algorithm. Um, so last time we talked about uh, convex hulls. Uh, we talked about um, uh, the uh, gift wrapping method, Jarvis' March, to find convex hull and log n time. Also, uh, Graham scan, also a different algorithm for co finding convex hull, same time complexity n log n. And uh, that relies on sorting bipolar angle and then uh, completing the uh, convex hull based on the resulting simple closed tour through the points. And um, we talked about beta heuristics combining the two and getting the best of both worlds. The time complexities are incomparable. One works in n times h time. The other works in time n log n. And either one is better than the other. It depends how h, the size of the convex hull, compares to n, the number of points. Of course, h can never exceed n, but it could be pretty close to it. Or it could be a small constant. depends on the circumstances. And we talked about other algorithms for convex hull. Quick hull based on quick sort type strategy. And also merge hull is divide and conquer way of finding convex hulls. Uh, we explained how that works. And uh, yeah, that's good. Uh, the old working time n log n, uh, worst case. We left off with the uh, lower bound for convex holes in general in the comparison based model, counting comparisons of things. <coughs> so the um, convex hole lower bound basically is a reduction from sorting. We take a sorting instance, arbitrary number of points to sort. There they are on the line, all laying on the x axis, so one, one dimensional problem. We convert it to a two dimensional <laughs> convex hole problem by squaring all the uh, x coordinates, raising them to this green parabola. Once you square all the points, they all lie in a parabola. The convex hole of the points on the parabola is uniquely determined by the in order sequence of the points. And then the end point connects to the uh, beginning point. So the com convex hole of these points is simply all these points connected up. So if you had a subroutine that can compute the convex hole in red on these green points, you can use that subroutine, however long it runs, to sort for you in general. How many get that? Which means that whatever convex hull subroutine you're running must take at least as long as sorting does. Because from that convex hull reply of that subroutine, you can sort for free, basically. So there's no such thing as a free lunch. That means the convex hull computation must take at least as much as sorting. Because you can sort using the convex hull subroutine in this manner. So this is a lower bound proof. It's a proof by contradiction. It's proven we're not a millionaire. It's usually not easy to do. But here we did it, and it's only one slide long. So it's a good day. How many understand this argument? OK. Any questions about this argument? Remember last time I said I would repeat this first thing in this next lecture. So it's important, because we'll see a lot more arguments of this type. And they'll get much more complicated than this one. So wrap your mind very tightly around this kind of argument, which is a reduction or transformation of one problem to another problem. Showing if you can solve problem A, you can for free solve problem B, which means problem B must take as least as long as problem A to solve. Right? You can think about examples from real life. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, becoming a billionaire is at least as hard as becoming a millionaire. How many believe that? Yeah, because on the way to becoming a billionaire, you, you could automatically become a billionaire at some point. Actually, making your first million is the hardest. But I digress. So that's a reduction. It's a reduction of the complexity or difficulty of becoming a millionaire to that of becoming a billionaire, or vice versa. You, you see the point. That's this kind of argument that we're talking about here. OK, so now we know, as a corollary to the fact that omega time n log n is necessary for convex hull computation, that's the lower bound, that Gram scan was an optimal algorithm. Before, we didn't know that. Could have been that maybe convex hulls can be computed in linear time, or time n log log n, or n square root of the log n, or some other sub n log log n time. 
But now we know that's not possible. It's, it's optimal. So basically what we did is we made the time for uh, grab scan from n log n, big O of n log n to, to theta. There it goes. Wait for it. Wait for it. Right there. Ta-da. So that's, that's the corollary here. Okay? Any questions about that? Okay. And I, I mentioned that in the, the Corman book, this is chapter 33, in the Perprata and Shamus book, which is even a deeper study of computational geometry, the whole book is about computational geometry, it's so roughly chapter 3 and also chapter 4. There's a lot more stuff in there than just convex holes, uh, algorithms that we've seen. There's many other algorithms for convex holes and other results, but uh, I refer you to that. So speaking of these other results, let me give you sort of a summary. Now, so we're not, we're not going to prove you know, each one of these because it, it's, it's, it's tricky. But let me just tell you what some of the results are. Uh, first result, the convex hull of a simple polygon can be found in linear time. So if the polygon is already simple and is given to you in, in ordered sequence around the periphery, as simple polygons are represented, because if they're not given to you in order around the periphery of the polygon, the polygon is not unique. Be lots of different polygons spanning that point set. So you can't just give arbitrary points and say that's my polygon. You have to say which one follows which around the periphery. Well, if you already have that, you can do the second part of Gram scan on that order, right? And from that, you can infer the sorted order. Um, so basically, very quickly, in linear time, from a simple polygon given to you, you can compute its, its convex hull. How many can see that? Okay. So it's like grab scan, except without sorting the points first. They're already sorted in order around. Okay. Um, in three dimensions, things get a little trickier, but there's an n log n, theta n log n algorithm for convex hole in 3D. Um, it's more involved, it's more complicated, not easy to describe, and so we won't bother you, you know, to, to go over that here. But just so you know, in 3D it can be done in time n log n as well. And of course it's optimal, because if, uh, if, if n log n time is required in 2D, it's also required in 3D or any higher dimension as well, because this 2D is a very special case of 3D or 4D or any higher dimension. It's just a, s a slice across that dimension, so you're ignoring the other dimension. So things always get more difficult with the higher dimension, never easier. That's, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, the convex hole in larger than three dimension, arbitrary dimension, dimension five or seven or nine or ten, can be done. There's algorithms that can find a convex hole in higher dimensions in time roughly n to the roughly half the dimension number. So for example, in, in dimension nine, this will be an n to the fifth algorithm because nine plus one over two is five. Uh, so there are algorithms that are general and roughly they take n to the half the dimension number raised to that power. So it grows pretty severely with each dimension. With every two dimensions, the exponent gets upped by one. You know, not, it's not exponential. It's not as bad as exponential. But it's not great either if your dimension is 100. I mean, n to the you know, 50 algorithm for convex holes in dimension 100 will not terminate within our lifetime for any kind of you know, non-trivial n. Right, so, uh, but, but still, that's what it is. Um, Identifying the points of the convex hull, basically, if I just ask you for the points of the convex hull, not necessarily the convex hull itself, not in order. Because you might think, okay, convex hull is n log n lower bound. Uh, maybe that's because uh, you know, some sorting needed to happen, because the two are pretty closely related. Right? Remember, the lower bound convex hull proof was sorting based. So you might say, well, maybe sorting is necessary to compute convex hulls. Uh, this says it isn't. This means convex hull is as hard as n log n, even if you don't report the sorted order of the points around the convex hull. You just report them in any order you'd like, you being the subroutine for the convex hull. But that too requires n log n lower bound. That's hard to prove, actually, because the reduction is longer from sorting. It's more involved, because you're not sorting here. It turns out it's even worse. The, um, you know, so this basically is saying that the hardness, the difficulty of Finding convex hull is not sorting based. It's inherently n log n. Okay. Uh, and there's more results of this type. Just deciding whether all the points, 
that I give you lie in the convex hull, and none of them are not on the convex hull. Just the, you know, just the binary query of yes, no. Are all the points I'm giving you are convex hull points of that point set? Yes, no. Turns out that requires n log n time as well. And that's just a single bit I'm returning to you, yes, no. So that, that Boolean query is n log n time lower bound as well. So it's, it's pretty, you know, convex holes are, are pretty difficult to determine. You know, by difficult, we mean not linear time, <coughs> more than linear time, you know, n log n in particular, in all, in all these other scenarios. So in some sense, you can conclude that convex hole computation is more difficult than sorting in this sense. Okay, that even if you didn't need to report them in sorted order, or you didn't even report them at all, just say yes, no, are they all convex hull points, that's n log n lower bound as well. For sorting, these problems are a lot easier. Right? So for example, for sorting, you can determine whether the points are already in order in linear time. Okay. You don't need to take n log n time to do that. For convex hull, it's still n log n. Also, dynamic convex hull maintenance. Basically, it says if new points are being added one at a time and you want to maintain the convex hull with every a new point, so that's called usually a dynamic version of the problem. It happens all the time in real life. Right? You have a database, you, you know, set it up and for fast queries, new things are being added to the database at every moment, and you still want the database index or you know, sorted uh, um, index to, to accommodate new queries, but you want to add new points quickly, new pieces of data quickly, like the Google search engine. You don't want to have to recompute the entire you know, Google database every time a new URL is added to it, obviously. Uh, so it turns out you can do it in log n time per each arriving point. The way you can do it is, so let's say you pre-computed the convex hull of all the points up to now, and it's already pre-computed. You've got this nice convex hull polygon. There it is, kind of symbolically. So it has millions of edges in it. Okay, new point comes in. Start with that new point and create tangent lines onto the convex hull that already exists. Create this tangent line and this tangent line. Okay, find these two purple points where this new point gets tangent lines onto the existing convex hull. Keep in mind that this convex hull is in sorted order already by definition. So as you start as you start going down these points, you're, dec you're, you're increasing the angle or decreasing the angle, and so and then the angle it keeps increasing, 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 increasing until it gets there, and then decreases, decreases as you go around and around. How many get that? So it's two chains, two monotonic chains. One increases, one decreases. You can take these two chains and merge them, and you get a single you know, monotonically increasing chain. But you don't even have to do that. What's the convex hull? of the, all these blue points plus this new green dot, this new green point that came in, which, how would you compute the new convex hole from the old convex hole? Quickly, you know, without recomputing it from scratch, obviously. Not, not a difficult question. Take a wild guess from this picture. Were, will all these points still be in the new convex hole when the green point is added, how many say yes, the outer point? How about these inner points? These points, will they be in the convex hole? No. So just eliminate this whole bunch, only one fell swoop. Keep this other bunch, connect this purple dot to the green and this purple dot to the green, eliminate all these guys, and you got the new convex hole. How many get this? Okay, so simple. The question is, how quickly can you figure out these two purple dots? And because you don't want to take linear time to do this. You, know, you want to do it much more quickly. Well, all these blue dots are descending polar angle down here on this chain and ascending polar angles here on that chain. Right? So if you have a bunch of things that are sorted in terms of size, how quickly can you determine some query about them, log, log time, binary search, right? Just like you can find a name in the, fo in the phone book quickly, because it's already pre-sorted. If it wasn't sorted, it will take linear time. But that's why phone books are sorted, or any other large collection of data is usually sorted by something so you can quickly 
make queries on it. So in log time, you can determine the highest angle and the lowest angle among this set of angles increasing and decreasing or whatever. And then you know what to connect to and what to eliminate, basically everything in between the two. And it gets eliminated, and, and you got your new convex hole in, in logarithmic time. So that's, that's a proof of this theorem We're using this algorithm right here. So actually, this one we proved. And the animation now shows you what we just discussed. Okay. So the new convex hole eliminates that whole chain. The point in green gets connected to the point in purple and to the other point in purple. And that's your new convex hole right there. And the whole thing was a couple of binary searches and uh, happened in logarithmic time. Okay. Uh, so it turns out separately that log n time is also required from for convex hole update when new points are, are being added. Why don't you prove that one to me in, in 10 seconds? Prove this theorem to me. So right now we showed that log n time is, is, is sufficient, so big O. But why is it that log time is also necessary, omega log n? Let's see if you get the hang of, of lower bounds here. How many understand the question? I don't know what your presumption is. Yeah, good. All right, so what, what do you say? Well, you want to show that no algorithm can accomplish this, this stunt in less than log n time. So if you say binary search, you're focusing on a specific algorithm. But you want to show that no algorithm can work any faster than this one did here, using binary search. But now we're talking about general algorithms, any algorithm in the universe. What it, maybe you can do a super duper hyper binary search that will work in log log time or even constant time. Prove to me that's not possible. Yeah. Linear time reduction to sorting or to searching. Um, yeah, you can do that, but there's even a simpler argument than that. Let's do a proof by contradiction. Yeah, wh what do you say? Yeah, exactly. That's it. So if you can do less than log n time point insertion and keep maintaining the convex hull, whatever less than log n time you're using, use that n times to keep building the convex hull to begin with, and that'll be your new convex hull algorithm, and it'll work in time n times whatever the less than log n time was for insertion of a single point, and that will break the lower bound argument for convex hulls, which we proved a couple slides ago. How do we understand this argument? And so we know the convex hole can be done in faster than n log n time. So point insertion can be done in less than log time. Otherwise, do it n times with point insertions. And then you have a less than n log n time you know, co uh, convex hole uh, subroutine, which we know is impossible. So that's, we just proved this one. Okay. So now we prove this one. This means that that trick right here was what? Optimal. So you see these, these, the more you prove, the more results you get. Okay. Now it turns out if you want to do deletions, it's more complicated than additions. Why? Because when you do a deletion, you can't just do two nice tangents and then eliminate one big long chain all in one fell swoop. Right? A lot of other weird things can, can, can happen. And so that's harder. But still, uh, you can do deletions with big O log squared. It's not too bad. It's just not quite log. It's log squared. Yep. So what I don't get is <coughs> if you have a list of points sorted by polar angle, yeah. then you can find the tangent points with log n time. Yeah. But you didn't know where the green point was until the green point arrived. That's right. So how do you have the list sorted by polar angle? Ah, good point. So he says, how do you have the list sorted by polar angle if you didn't know uh, the uh, uh, where the green point was, it's sorted by some order and not necessarily with respect to the green point that you didn't have yet. Excellent point. What do you say to that? How many understand his, his point? Yeah, very good point he makes. What do you say to that? Start with a green point, go to the middle of this polygon, 
that's it. And if you want to find the least, see, see what the angle is to, to, to halfway in this list of points that's the polygon, the convex hole. Check the same angle for the left neighbor and the right neighbor. One of them will be greater than, one will be less than. So now you know which half of the remaining you should keep probing to find the maximum or the minimum. And so let's say you want to find the minimum. So you go to half of the lower list. And you should check then its neighbors, left and right, and see which one is lower or higher than what you need. And you keep going that, and you divide the space by half each time. And before, you, after you do it log times, you know, you'll, you'll end up in a particularly unique place on a single point. But that's, that's an excellent point he made. We, we kind of glossed over that detail, but yeah, that's, that's how you can do it. Um, sort of what you do with a, with a phone book, right? But this is a really a two-dimensional version, so you know, phone book is just one-dimensional space, you know, letters or characters, or strings. OK, that's a very good point. Um, OK, so for deletions, log squared n time is necessary, but it's doable. Uh, well, let's say it's sufficient, uh, is what the theorem there says. But it's, it's doable, it's just more complicated. Now I'm going to present to you one of the most elegant algorithms we've ever seen. Um, and that's saying a lot, because I've seen a lot of algorithms in my 40 years of uh, looking at these things. So this is a convex hole algorithm that will beat all the previous ones that we've seen in terms of time. Uh, it's by Timothy Chan. He's a, a professor in Canada. So again, um, the, one of the subroutines we'll use here is that if you have a convex polygon, and you have a point off the polygon, in log time, you can find two tangents, which is what we just did on the previous slide. So I just remind you how it's done. You know, you take this point, and then you find the tangent by doing a binary search on all the other points, seeing what's the greatest angle. Then you do a binary search on all the other points, seeing what's the, the smallest angle. You're doing this probe each time. You know, you do the trig to find the angle, right? I won't, won't bother with all this. But that's a subroutine we're going to use, among other things. All right. So how, we, how will this algorithm work? Uh, you have a bunch of points. And it's a recursive divide and conquer. It's, uh, uh, well, it's not even that recursive. It's just, it's, just, uh, it's just divide and conquer. It's repeated divide and conquer, is I guess you could characterize it that way. Assume you knew the size of the convex hole, which we don't. But assume you knew it. So I assume you knew what h was, the number of points in the convex hole. Let's call it M. You'll see why I'm giving it another name besides H in a second, because it'll be a parameter in this algorithm. So I'm going to divide the points into N over M sets of M points each to a total of N, of N points. So these are N points divided into N over M sets of M points each. So let's say here are some green points, here are some yellow points, blue points, and uh, purple points. So I'm dividing into equal size subsets. How many subsets? N over M. What is M? It's the size of the convex hull. We don't know that yet, what the size of the convex hull is, but you'll see in a minute what happens. Okay. Compute the convex hull of each subset. And let's use Graham's algorithm as a subroutine. So now we use the Graham scan. We sort each one by the polar angle around some arbitrary point. You compute the convex hull of each subset. These subsets are arbitrary, by the way. They're not partitioned according to x axes or y axes. Just random subsets of fixed size. <coughs> How big is size? N over M. Uh, well, size M, but N over M of them to a total of M of N points. All right, so here are the uh, four convex holes of these four subsets. OK. So N over M is four in this case. Uh, and we, s we, uh, we, we assume that, uh, that uh, M is the size of the convex hull overall, which is also H. All right, so we've got a bunch of small convex hulls, arbitrary. And, and look, they can intersect. They can overlap. There's no relationship among these convex hulls to each other. Right? They can be any old, which, any which way, however you partition, happen to partition the point set. It doesn't matter. All right. 
Next, you're going to compute Jarvis's march. But instead of on points, you compute Jarvis's march on polygons, on these convex polygons, which are the convex holes of these subsets. So we're generalizing con Jarvis's march, the gift wrapping method, to wrap, instead of points, larger objects, polygons. Of course, a po you can think about a point as a degenerate polygon with only a single vertex. Now we're generalizing the gift wrapping method to work on polygons, not just points. But it's straightforward because it's, it's the same concept. It's like when you gift wrap stuff, you can gift wrap, wrap arbitrary things. You know, y y y you don't just gift wrap, you know, shoe boxes and, and toaster ovens. You can gift, gift wrap a bicycle. It'd be a lot trickier because it's all be odd shaped and larger, and you want to make sure that the handlebar doesn't hook the paper that you're using to give. But aside from that, you can gift wrap anything. You can gift wrap a building, gift wrap a whole city if you want, you know, in theory at least. So here we're going to gift wrap these polygons. How? Uh, very much like regular gift wrapping. Start at the least x coordinate. You can find that quickly in linear time, and start rotating it until you get a tangent line that has the greatest angle to one of the other sets. So try tangent lines from the green point to the blue set, to the purple set, to the yellow set. Compute both tangents of each and see which ones gives you the one with the greatest polar angle with respect to this starting green point. And in this case, it's this one. If you try to make a tangent to this purple set, the tangent will be to here. And it'll be not quite as large angle as this angle here. To the blue point, the tangent will be to there. So you're picking the best tangent with respect to how, how, how large the angle is with respect to this tangent. And that gives you the first edge of the gift wrapping convex hole over all these sub-convex holes that are covered. Okay. Now, uh, there still remains a question, how fast can you compute each tangent? But now you see where this subroutine comes in. Right? If you have a point and some convex polygon, you can compute both of these tangents in logarithmic time. So in log time, you can find the tangent to this polygon. In log time, separately, you can find the, the tangent to this polygon, to this polygon, to any particular single polygon. Of course, you're doing this tangent computation many times. One per polygon, or actually two per polygon, to find, say, both tangents, just to be on the safe side. All right, so you found one edge. What do you do next? Start here, continue gift wrap. Find all the tangents to all the polygons and find the one that kind of maximizes this, this angle, this polar angle. And then you find the next edge of these convex holes of all of them. Okay. And you keep repeating this process. Now, here's the catch. How many times do we repeat this process to get the entire red convex hole of all of them? Do the next one, find this edge in red, and so on and so on. How many times do you repeat that before you get the entire red convex hole? M times. How many is that? Because M is the size of the convex hole. So after M of those procedures, you'll have the entire convex hole. But you don't know what M is, because M is equal to H. If you knew what M was, your job will be very easy. Do it M times, you'll be done. But M is part of the out output. M is equal to H. So we, we don't know what H is, so we can't do it H times. But for now, let's say you do it M times. Let's, just, let's pretend we know what M is. We do it M times, we're done. So if we knew what M, what H was, and therefore what M is, uh, let's 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 just say, what's the time complexity of doing all this? Well, so you're doing a bunch of gram scans. How many n over m gram scans? Why? Because it's n over m sets, right? So for each set in different color, blue, purple, yellow, green, you're doing gram scans. So n over m of these sets. So n over m gram scans. Each gram scan. How long does it take? Well, it's n log n, but n now is this number. So, so um, excuse me, there's m points in each, so it's really m log m per gram scan, per single gram scan. There's that many gram scans, n over m 
gram scans. So the total time is n over m gram scans times the time per gram scan, which is m log m. The m's cancel nicely here, and you just get n log m time complexity for the entire process, assuming you knew what m was. How many understand that analysis, time complexity? OK. Uh, it's only a third of the class raising hand, so shall I repeat it? OK. Uh, you're doing a gram scan for the green points, a gram scan for yellow points separately, a gram scan for the blue points separately, a gram scan for the purple points separately. So you're doing n over m gram scans because there's n over m groups of m points each. Multiply the number of groups by the number of points for each, and you get n over m times m, which is just n, the total number of points. That's what this parameter m is. It's the divisor of the number, you know, giving you the number of groups. It's also the size of the convex hull. Uh, OK, so you do a bunch of gram scans. How many n over m? Each gram scan is m times log m, because the size of the group is m points each. Gram scan takes m log m time, or n log n time, or however you want to think. It's just a parameter, the, si the size of the number of points you take doing a gram scan over. So the total time is how many gram scans you do times the time per gram scan. And when you multiply it together, you get an upper bound of n log m. Right. How many understand it now? Oh, good. That's a lot more. So I'm glad I repeated. All right. Uh, so that's all the gram scans. No, but that's not the entire algorithm. The algorithm was a bunch of gram scans. Then you get all these um, nicely color-coded convex hulls. But then you got to do Jarvis March. You got to do gift wrapping around those. Starting with the green and gift wrap and gift wrap and gift wrap. Well, so how, how, how long does this gift, gift wrapping take? Well, the number of times you gift wrap is m, because you're doing another edge, another edge to get the entire red convex hole. And there's m edges there. m is equal to h. So there's m of them. Okay. And. Um, for each point, you got to check all the other convex holes to find the angle. So you find the, you, to find the tangent from the green points to all the other ones so that you can know which tangent line has the greatest polar angle, you got to do it as many times as you have groups. Well, how many groups do you have? n over m. And so that's that multiplier here. For each point you find in a convex hole, you got to look at all the other groups to find tangents. And to find the tangent, takes logarithmic time. And that's the time here. Logarithmic in what? The size of the group. But the group is of size m. So that's the total time complexity to do all the Jarvis gift wrapping around all these convex holes that we got from the first step, from all the grams scans. Well, nicely, the m cancels the m. And you got n log m. Again, same as here. And the total time is just this plus that, because you're doing both one after the other. So the total time complexity of all of this algorithm is n log m. How many get that? OK, any questions so far? Because we're not done yet. We're halfway there. Why aren't we done? Well, we're not done because we don't know what h is. So we don't know how long we, should, we need to run this. Because h could be pretty high. h could be you know, roughly n. And if h is, is n, This, this whole algorithm can take n log n time, not n log h time. We're going for an n log h time algorithm here, just by the way, just so you know. We know it's not, not going to be less than n log n in the worst case. But if you, all wanna if you also want to consider the convex hole size in the time complexity, it could be n log h. That doesn't break the lower bound of n log n time. It just makes it output sensitive, makes it faster if there's less points in the convex hole. That's OK. It's like saying sorting takes n log n time. So I say, OK, how about if I give you a sorted list already? How long does it take you to sort then? If this list is already sorted. Really linear time. Even using bubble sort, it'll still be linear time if the list is already sorted. And you say, well, really linear time? So, so that breaks the n log n lower bound for sorting? No, not really. Because the lower bound is for general sets, not for particular sets that are already sorted or near sorted. 
So just keep keep that in mind. Okay. So in general, we can't break the n log n lower bound for convex solve, but for specific cases where h is much less than n, it could be n log h, and that's what we're going for here. And n log h will be never as bad, never worse than n log n, and often a lot better. How many how many understand that? Because h could be a worst n, but often is a lot less than n. It could be a constant, actually. OK. But the reason we're not finished yet with all this is because we don't know what m is. Because we don't know what h is. And here comes the next, the next trick. And the next trick is, is, is beautiful and subtle. <laughs> we're going to guess what, what h is and keep guessing larger and larger values of h. And at the end, you'll see the time complexity converges to something very reasonable, actually something amazing. It'll be n log h. Okay. But how will that work? We don't know what h is. So what we're going to do is the following. Because if we don't guess it carefully, and just assume it's huge, like n, you know, if, if you take this process too far and keep gift wrapping around for too many steps, the, 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 the gram scan time will dominate, and you'll get n log n running time. On the other hand, if you guess m to be too small, Jarvis's gift wrapping method will dominate, and the time will be like n times h. And neither one of these is too cool. Right? n times h could be quadratic in some cases. How many understand that? So we don't want to go there, which means we can't guess m to be too small. And we don't want to guess m to be too large, because otherwise it'll just be gram scan on almost individual points, or close to it. Right? And then gram scan time will, will dominate. It'll be n log n, so why bother with this whole trickery if you just gram scan on the original points and then be done with it? OK, so here's what we're going to do instead. How do we get a good m number of subsets to partition these original point set into? So the idea is to keep guessing. Keep increasing m until it exceeds h. In other words, first, Try something very small, m equal to 1, and then something a little larger and a little larger, and keep doing this. And remember, m is the number of points in the convex hull, so the Jarvis march after m steps will stop it, will abort it at each, at each uh, level of guessing. So start with, say, small m, like make it equal to 2. 1 is kind of trivial because it's, it's one group, you know, you're not going to do that. So start with 2. And if 2 proves too small, increase it. But don't increase it to 3 and then 4 and then to 5. Th that those increases are too small steps. And if you keep doing that 2, then 3, then 4, then 5, until you reach the m is equal to h, what will happen is it'll add up to way too, too much. You want to take leaps and bounds. You want to increase it substantially at every step so that you don't take too many iterations because the work at every iteration will be abandoned. If you pick a small, too small of an n and Jarvis March does it for m steps and doesn't get all the way around because the m is smaller than h because we're increasing m until it hits h for different phases of this algorithm. If you pick too small of an m, Jarvis March will do it m times, not reach the end, and then we're going to abort, ignore throw away all that previous work, and restart the entire algorithm from scratch with a bigger m. And the m will keep squaring. Okay, So by squaring, we mean first we'll try 2, then 2 squared, then 2 squared, squared, which is 2 to the fourth. So m grows exponentially in this, in this way. Right? It gets 2 to the fourth, then 2 to the eighth, then 2 to the sixteenth, uh, until it gets to 2 to the 2 to the t, which will finally exceed h, and then Jarvis's march to gift wrapping will run to completion because m is larger than h. And so when Jarvis's march computes h of the convex hull 
edges, it would, it would stop because it would reach the end. There's no need to do any more work. And let's call this parameter t, because we keep squaring it. We're not doubling it. We're doing worse than doubling. We're squaring it at every point. You'll see in a minute why we're increasing it so aggressively instead of just doubling it. Doubling it would be aggressive enough. That's exponential growth right there by doubling and doubling and doubling. Here we're doing worse than doubling. We're doubling the exponent, not just doubling the quantity, which means we're squaring the quantity. All right, so until we get to 2 to the 2 to the t, and that finally will be larger than h, and t in this case will be smaller than the ceiling of log log h. How many can see this relation here? OK, right? Because if you raise 2 to the 2 to the log log h, that's h. Just like 2 to the log x is x, by definition of the log, right? base 2. All right, so why, why is this a good strategy? We're about to see why. And, and this is really amazing how it converges. So the total time will be n log of 2 to the 2 to the t as t goes from 1 to log log h. Right? So we start with small. And then we get larger and larger and larger. And as we get larger and larger and larger, it's n log 2 to the 2 to the t. So this quantity here is m, right? And here we have log of m, right? So uh, we keep running the entire algorithm from scratch for increasingly large values of m, and the algorithm runs in time n log m each time. And so you add up all these n log m's. And here, all I did in this line is I took this n that's independent of anything inside this sum and put it outside, just for you know, sim simplifying it. So this n went outside, right? This n went outside here. How many can see that? Just algebraic step, you know, nothing mysterious. Yeah, so he's asking, shouldn't this be 2 to the 2 to the 2? So another thing I did, the log of 2 to the 2 to the t is what? 2 to the t, and there it is, without the log. Well, that's a good point. How many see that transformation? The log of 2 to the 2 to the t is just 2 to the t, right? and the log is gone here, this, this log here. The bounds on this I still kept the same. From t goes from 1 to log log h of 2 to the t. But now we have a nice sum of exponentials, right? So if you add up 2 to the t a bunch of times, what's the total sum of all these 2 to the t's? If I say 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 plus 2 to the k, all the way up to k, powers of 2 from 1 to k. Roughly, what is it equal to? 2 to the k plus 1, to the k plus one right? And that's what this is. This is that plus 1, right? So I take that many increasing exponentials, and the answer is 2 to whatever the number is, plus 1, roughly. Well, that plus 1 doesn't matter because it's just 2 times whatever this is. And here we got 2 to the log log h. What's 2 to the log log h? Log h. Right? And there's log h. So that the rest is, all this is just algebra, basically. So the total time complexity is n log h. Yeah. Good question. He says, when, why do we start with m is equal to 2 if two points cannot make a convex hull? Well, can they make a convex hull? Can the convex hull just be two points? How many say the convex hull cannot be just two points? How many say the convex hull may be two points in some cases? OK, we've got a split vote, so it's a good question. Well, which one is it? Two points or m never two points? 
when can a convex hole be two points only? It's a degenerate case. It's a very special case. But it could happen, actually. When? All points are collinear. They're all on a line. So the convex hull is just the two endpoints. Because all the other points are linear combinations of those two endpoints. So they're not on the convex hull. <laughs> yes, convex hull is a polygon. So the polygon will be one point connected to the other point and a second segment, the last point, second point connected to the first. So yeah, you'll, you'll have these two edges like that, but except they're on top of each other, but they're still separate edges. So it's a degenerate case, a special case. But that's a good point. So it could be, so, so two could, could, be, could be that. It turns out, you know, even if it's not, it doesn't hurt to start at two. If you start it at two or at something, or the next one, three, uh, you get similar results. The, ar the algebra will work uh, still to converge to n log h. But that's, that's a good thought. What else? So look at what we did. You know, what we did is really amazing. We took two slower algorithms, asymptotically slower algorithms, and combined them into a single faster one than either one. That's, that's a really good day in algorithm design. When you take two subroutines, each of which works in slow asymptotic time, somehow bang these two subroutines together into some meta heuristic that using these two subroutines works in much faster time than either subroutine. It's almost counterintuitive, if not for the fact that we're not calling these two subroutines on the original entire set. We're calling it on pieces and trying different things. And if it doesn't work, we abort and start again with different rearrangement of the sets into subsets and on and on and on, according to the scheme. And that's how we pull it off. But still, we use two subroutines, each of which is slower, in a meta heuristic that runs faster than either one, asymptotically, not just sometimes, always. Pretty amazing. So that, that's a Jedi trick that you should definitely wrap your mind around and sometimes use in your career or life. And uh, it works amazingly when it does work. I mean, so it's not to say that you could pull this off for every problem every time you try. No, I mean, this is, this is a rare occasion. But when it does work, it works beautifully. So this algorithm, Chan's algorithm, is optimal not just in N, but also in H. It's not just optimal in the input size, it's optimal in the output size as well, amazingly. Turns out you cannot do any better than n log h if you take these two parameters to represent your time complexity. So it is a meta heuristic. And look at what we've done, which is also amazing. At every step, if, if a particular m didn't work, and what do we mean by m not working? We mean we take the size of M that we're guessing right now might be OK. We're running all these gram scans and all these subsets. Then we're doing gift wrapping Jarvis March around all these convex holes that we get. And we don't get to the end because we only do it for M steps. And we didn't close the loop and find the entire convex hole. So what do we do? Abandon all that work, throw it away, ignore it, waste it, and start over with a different M, which is another counterintuitive thing that to be so highly efficient, you need to throw away a lot of work over and over and over again. That's, that's amazing, because it seems like such a waste. But by wasting every single iteration, a bunch of stuff that you did, you, you win at the end. And again, that's true in life, too, in many scenarios. Venture capitalists use this kind of approach all the time. What do I mean by that? They use it to become rich. How do they do it? Yeah, start a startup. Give it two years. Put in 10, 20 million bucks, whatever it takes. It doesn't work in two years, you shut it down. No excuses, no delays. 
You start another one. Let it have a chance. It doesn't work. You shut it down. Start again. In Silicon Valley, that's called a fail-fast approach to venture capital. It's OK to fail. Just don't do it slowly. Fail quickly is much better. Abandon it. Start over. Fresh start. And of course, venture capitalists don't necessarily serialize this approach. They can parallelize it. You can invest in 10 different startups or 20 different startups, $10 million each. They know that 19 will fail. They, they just don't know which 19. That 20th becomes Google or Facebook. And it pays for a lot more than the other 19 that fail. Question. Yeah, so he's saying here we're squaring the size of M in every iteration. We're squaring and squaring. Why squaring? First of all, why not just double it? Why not just add one to it? Why, 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 why not say M is equal to two, then three, then four, then five? Why, why even increase it by more than one? How many see that if you increase it by one, it'll still be correct, it'll work? It'll work. Eventually, you'll find the right M. And you'll finish, and then you can report your answer. But, but what, what's the problem with that? It's not making enough progress for every wasted batch of effort, increasing it by one. You, you're not gaining very much at every iteration. You're just gaining a little bit. And the total amount of waste will be horrendous. And the total time complexity will be a lot worse than n log h. It probably will be quadratic, just like Jarvis's march to begin with. Or even worse, maybe, because you, you know, it could be even worse than quadratic. You, know, you have to work it out, you know, work out the algebra. So why not double it? Well, if you double it and double it and double it, it'll be better than adding one, but it won't quite be as efficient as this, and you won't get n log h. You might get n times h, or you know, so, some, something worse than n log h. You could do the algebra and, and see what happens. And so. Squaring it every time happens to work, because the algebra right here works out. What if you cubed it, or you know, quintupled it, or you, know, you, you know, cubed it every time, or you, quite, you know, raise it to the fourth power or the fifth power every time? That, that may work, too. Um, but um, it, the, the growth may be there a little too, too large, and then you may get inefficiency due to the fast growing. In other words, M will, will sort of grow past H eventually, but it will grow so much faster than H, pa zoom right past H, end up way many miles down the road past H, that it's way, way larger than H, and then it'll be inefficient because it's not quite near H. You're doing a lot more work than, than H. M will be a lot bigger than H, not necessarily just the next reasonable jump over, but much farther down. And you could, again, work out the, the algebra and see how much worse it'll be. Um, maybe it'll be OK by cubing it. I'm not saying it wouldn't be. But there's a potential there for overshooting H too much, overshooting your target. And then there'll be a lot of wasted work right there. Um, maybe not. And maybe it'll work out. But, you could do, but squaring it works. Uh, doubling it won't work. Or tripling it, yeah. Ah, so we're saying, we're saying this, this increasing uh, squaring of m wouldn't give us the exact value of h, just an approximation. Yeah, true. Very good point. We don't need to know the exact value of h while we're trying to compute the convex hull. At the end, we'll know the exact value of h. Why? Because the convex hull will be computed when m exceeds h. We'll finish Jarvis's gift wrapping much to completion all the way around. We know to stop because we the end will reach the beginning. And then we'll know h, h exactly which we didn't know before we started. So eventually, we'll know h exactly. But the trick is to increase this parameter aggressively, but not too aggressively, until it exceeds h. And when it, the first time it exceeds h, it'll stop at h. It wouldn't go to this. So I guess cubing it by this reasoning, cubing it will, uh, will work also. But squaring it works nicely, and so we don't need to worry about larger powers than, than squaring it. Very good point. Uh, any other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, 
randomly. The partition is random. That's the beauty of this. When you partition into subsets, do it any which way you want. So the subsets are completely unrelated to each other. They, they can overlap, they can intersect, they can contain, you know, the convex hull of these subsets can contain each other, the convex hull of these subsets can intersect or not intersect, it doesn't matter. This works any which way. Which means you could probably do other optimizations and choose them more judiciously to try to, you know, save some work. But whatever the work you'll save was will not get you below this bound, and this is already optimal in both N and H, so asymptotically, you don't need to do much else. You can just pick them randomly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he's saying, you know, isn't the convex hole lower bound n log n, and doesn't that break the lower bound, right? That yeah, so if n is equal to h, then it's n log n. But is basically, essentially, you're asking why doesn't this uh, contradict or break the lower bound of n log n for convex holes? So what do you say to that? Another fair, fair question. What do you say to that? It assumes that n and h are not equal, he's saying. Um, they could be equal. If they're equal, this is n log h, which would be n log n if n is equal to h. But why does this work faster than the n log n lower bound if they're not equal? If h is much smaller than n, h could be the square root of n, and h could be the log of n. And h could be a constant, not even related to n directly, just be an absolute constant. And this will work in time n times a constant, which is n. So this could work in linear time in many cases. Why doesn't it contradict the lower bound of n log n in the general lower bound for convex hulls of n log n? Very good question. What do you say to that? Let me give you an analogy from sorting. Right? That's, that's one of the other reasons, reason number 57, why we harp on sorting so much, because it encapsulates so many algorithmic ideas and notions. Sorting takes n log n in general lower bound. We all know that. Right? We've seen the proof of that. So if I want to sort uh, the integers, if I want to sort a million integers, all between 0 and 9 each, I can do bucket sort. Right? Create 10 buckets, 0 through 9. Take the million numbers between 0 and you know, uh, take the million numbers all between 0 and 9, put them into the buckets, and then each bucket will be the count of how many numbers we have of that value, 0 through 9, and then just spit out that many of each, and uh, how long does this sort take? If I have uh, n numbers between 0 and 9, and n could be a million, a billion, a trillion, linear time, right? How many can see linear time? But wait a second, linear time, why doesn't that break the general lower bound of n log n for sorting. Why, why is this linear time all of a sudden? Does, is that a contradiction? No, because it does not use the comparison between Yeah, it, it doesn't use comparison between elements. And even worse than that, it's not general. It's very specific for numbers between 0 and n. Okay. If you want number between 0 and a trillion, this wouldn't be n log n. It would be quadratic or, or whatever. But you know, it would be, be a lot worse than n, than, than n log n, or certainly less than, worse than linear and potentially even worse than n log n. Um, so uh, the general bound is true in general. The general bound for a problem, lower bound, is, is the worst case behavior across all possible inputs. It's not to say that every single instance should take that long. H how many understand the difference? It's a pessimistic worst case scenario. Just like if a list was already sorted, you can just do bubble sort, and then bubble sort will work in linear time on a sorted list. You try to do exchange any pair, nothing gets exchanged because they're all already in order, and then you'll know that you did a single pass with nothing exchanged. You can stop in linear time. End of story. But the lower bound for bubble sort in general is not linear, it's quadratic in the worst case. 
Just because there's a few easy cases doesn't mean that in general it's easy or that in general it's not hard. Let me give you another example from real life. You know, does it, you know, bec becoming, becoming a millionaire I is hard. You have to work for many years and do all the right things and you know, make a lot of good decisions and then, then you're a millionaire one day. But some people become millionaires very quickly, easily. They just buy a lottery ticket. And all of a sudden they make $100 million on this jackpot. But I just said that becoming a millionaire is hard. How is it easy for them? Well, they're very lucky, and it's very rare, this scenario. Very unlikely. Right? It's not the general case of becoming a millionaire. It's a very special, specific, rare case <coughs> of becoming a millionaire. You can also take, take your last paycheck and go to Vegas with it. And if you're very, very lucky, on very rare occasions, you may play roulette and become a millionaire on, on just starting with 10 bucks. Yeah, uh, That's not the easiest or the best or the most you know, advisable way of becoming a millionaire. In fact, I strongly advise you against that strategy. Don't do that. <laughs> you just, you'll just lose your, your money, basically. Um, so back to this. Um, N log N is a lower bound, but it doesn't mean that some cases are not easier than that. This algorithm is adaptive. Sometimes this will run in N log N time, yeah, if H is large. But sometimes this will finish very quickly if H is small compared to n. And in fact, it'll never take more time than the log of h times n. So this algorithm adapts not just to the input size n, it adapts to the output size h. So it covers all bases. So if there is a way to compute the convex hull faster because h is small, this will do it. Graham scam will not. Jarvis March will not. These other algorithms, quick hull and merge hull and these other ones that we've seen for convex, they will not. <coughs> okay. Uh, are we good? All right. Any other questions? They're good questions. I'm glad you're asking those questions. So, so, so this, this algorithm is, is pretty amazing. It combines two slower ones to give you a faster one, which is counterintuitive already. Plus, it throws away a lot of work, which is another counterintuitive notion to do. But again, in business, you, you know, that's the fail-fast method of, of venture capitalism. Right? Fail fast, don't, whatever you do, don't fail slowly. That's, that's, that's not great strategy. Algorithmically here, it works very, very nicely. So, uh, OK. Um, remember this problem? Does every simple closed curve contain the vertices of an equilateral triangle? How many worked on this problem? Just what, five, ten people? Five people? OK, well, if only five of you have even worked on this. Never mind. Got, uh, I guess there's no point in showing you the answer, because I'll just be depriving you of the opportunity to become a better problem solver. So we'll, we'll get back to this. Uh, don't want to do that to you. That will be uh, insulting your intelligence. Uh, let's talk about the final or the midterm. Um, Let's take a vote, first of all, if you want the midterm um, and the final uh, in class or take home. I'm a bit very strong proponent of democracy, and uh, so we'll take a vote. Uh, how many want it um, uh, in class exam? How many want a take home? Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. The majority has spoken. Okay. Can't vote twice, but it's not necessary because you know, obviously there's a clear majority. All right, so be it. Uh, take home. Uh, so what I'm willing to do is have a window of a few days, like maybe four or five days, say for the midterm. And within those four or five days, you can work on the exam for six contiguous hours. OK, so you have six hours. But you can choose which six hours within the sliding window of several days. So you can schedule it, optimize it to you know, relative to your other obligations and exams and homeworks and due dates and so on. So I'm giving you that option rather than to make it a fixed time, which may not be convenient for you. You, know, you may be traveling or interviewing or whatever. So um, OK with that strategy? So it gives you a lot of flexibility, basically. And wh why six hours? Because you know, 
if you worked on problems all along and went to the Monday night sessions and worked in study groups and solved problems from the problem sets, and remember, most of the problems on the exams will come from the problem sets, will be related very similar to problems from the problem sets, and everything also did for extra credit is, is fair game, assuming I, I didn't give you the answer, because I'm not going to ask you a question on the exam that I already answered in class. I'm not going to insult your intelligence that way. Uh, so uh, six hours should be more than enough time. In fact, one hour will be enough to write down all the answers to the, to the exam if you work problems all along. So six hours is like several, a factor of three or four more than necessary. On the other hand, if you didn't work any problems all along and you postponed everything to the last one, which I told you repeatedly not to do, if you thought you can become a MacGyver the, the night before an exam, which you can't and it doesn't work that way, uh, if you didn't pay attention and didn't solve problems, didn't work in groups, didn't come to the Monday night sessions, uh, six weeks won't help you, never mind six days, never mind six hours. Because you're going to have to start becoming a problem solver from scratch, and you know, that doesn't happen overnight. And you've had already a couple of months, and you have another few weeks to the exam. And so uh, that's why I'm saying six hours. Um, much more than enough time if you solved a lot of problems already. Because most of the problems that are going to be in the exam, you've seen before, simply because I, I'm going to keep my promise that most of them will come from the problem set, which you've seen since day one of the class. Actually, before day one, even, before class started, it's already posted. So the remaining issue is when should we schedule it? Um, when would you like to? A couple of weeks from now, say, starting? Which, which date? Uh, November, I think, will be a little too, a little too late because, you know, that's the last four weeks of class. I mean, classes end in, like, first week of December, and we need to, time to grade it and return to you. So that might be a little too late. Um, maybe, the, the la maybe the last week of the, of the month. That gives you, you know, three, up to three weeks extra time, right? I'm not, it's only the 10th, and if you do it towards the end of the window, so, so the window will be like basically the last, you know, say the last, you know, five days of the month or something like that, or, or the, you know, the last week. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send out the exact dates, but it roughly will be the last week of the month, five days within the last week. Not necessarily to the last day of the month, but right in there, uh, the last uh, week or so, say a window of five days. And they can download it in leisure, work on it. You know. So even if you travel or interview, you can still do it remotely. No big deal. You'll be going to Collab, downloading it. It will be time stamped. And then you upload it to Collab. It will be time stamped again. That's how we enforce, that's how we enforce a six-hour you know, uh, consecutive uh, time block. Download to upload time. Yeah? So the exam will probably consist of problem set one and two. But will we have gotten this problem set three by the time that? So he's asking which problem sets are we talking about. So Remember, the problem sets are not necessarily, they're arranged somewhat by topics, but not exactly by topics. You know, there's problems of all kinds on each set. But obviously, I'm not going to, you know, I never play gotcha with you. I don't want to trip you. I want you to all get A pluses if, you know, if, if, if you help me make that possible. Um, so I'm not going to, you know, it's not going to be like really, really difficult problems, but I'm not going to insult your intelligence by putting a bunch of simple, trivial exercises and nothing else on the exam, because that will just be boring to you. I don't want to bore you. Uh, so, uh, so which sets? It'll be mostly stuff that you've seen before, that we talked about before, you know, approaches that we've seen, you know, kind of sorting, searching, kind of uh, computational geometry, and general problem solving that we've, we've seen before. You know, it's hard to, to completely contain it to the first two sets, but I could say maybe most of them will come from the first two sets. But I can't guarantee that one uh, or, or, or you know, one problem won't come from, from the third set or whatever. But for example, I'm not going to put any questions about NP completeness because we haven't covered it yet. And I don't I'm not going to do that to you. Right? I'm not going to put problems from topics that we haven't even started covering. Right? Um, so it'll all be pretty familiar, straightforward. That's my hope. Right? So we can say most of them will come from the first two sets. But I, I, you know, it's not 100% true, but it's like, you know, 85 or 90 percent true. Uh, any questions about that? And for the for the final, I guess we'll do the same. You know, we, I assume the vote for take home covered both the midterm and the final. Uh, let's make sure. How many want the final in class? How many want the final take home? Oh, okay. Again, so 
my assumption was correct. So take home for the fi and se similar setup for the for the final. There'll be a window of several days. You can just download it from Colab, work on it for six hours, submit it back to Colab, and the story. So some people ask me, you know, when when is the final going to be? Can we travel to some place, you know, buy airline tickets or whatever? So yeah, sure. I mean, it's going to be over the web anyway. Colab downloaded, uploaded. So even if you travel or already somewhere other than Charlottesville, you can still do this, and no, no big deal. So my gift to you, uh, high flexibility. Uh, of course, on the, on the exam itself, when the, the exam starts for you, you know, you, then you can't look up anything on the web, and you can't just do Google searches and, and go to, uh, to uh, you know, Chug or one of those uh, cheating websites. Yeah, we have accounts on those too, by the way, and you know, we can see what's there, so just, just so you know. If you copy from one, one, one of those chug or whatever websites that you think is a, a fancy, tricky, foolproof way to cheat, it doesn't work. Um, the TAs have accounts on those, and they, they, they troll those websites, same as you. So uh, we know where it comes from. It's just, just word to the wise. Uh, there have been some embarrassing cases in the past where you know, we ask people, you know, we, we see where they copied it from, so we call them in and we say, could you explain you know, your answer to question number three in the exam, and they look at us almost innocently and say, uh, no, I can't explain it, sorry. You say, okay, you know, you're still a good person, but you get a zero on the exam. You know. <laughs> Try better next time. You know. um, or whatever, I mean, uh, don't want to belabor this point, but you know, one third of the syllabus, the thir third page of the syllabus talks about cheating policy. So please reread this just to make sure you don't uh, make these obvious mistakes uh, or strategy errors. Okay, what else? Uh, anything else about the exams or questions or anything? Um, yeah. Uh, the grades, well, I, I want you all to get A pluses, you know, seriously. Uh, you know, so help me help you, you know, like Jeremy McGuire says. Um, you know, so so uh, uh, partial credit, you know, is is definitely something we do. You know, so if you you know even if you can't get the exact answer or, or you don't know quite the algorithm, just tell us what you do know. Show us what you tried. Show us what didn't work. Give us something to work with. It's hard to give partial credit to a blank page, obviously, but uh, you know if you show some knowledge and some attempts and nice tries and you know that, you get a lot of credit for that it doesn't have to be all the way all the way there necessarily to get to get a lot of credit or partial credit um, but do work on a lot of problems work how many are working in groups study groups meeting regularly okay it should be all of you at this point you know, don't, don't just work in isolation by yourself it's not very effective you know, meet two three times a week Monday nights like it's open you know open meeting, you know, you can come in and work problems and work with people and ask the TAs question. The TAs are available every single day of the week, including weekends. You know, Monday night, I buy you pizza, my gift to you. And that's quite a hefty bill over a semester if you do the math. But I don't mind. I'm trying to encourage you to, to work on problems and come in and collaborate and collude. No, not collude, just collaborate. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's, it's all good. You know, it, it, it works out. So today we'll, we'll do something unheard of. We'll finish one minute before the end of the official time. How about that? All right, see you next time. following week. Uh, which date? The ninth, I think, is the end of class. Yeah, so maybe a few days after that, something like that. So, and one more thing, so we discussed on like Chan's and and we gave parallels to bubble sort being a like a special case of both. So are we saying that Chan's is not generalized? It is, right? Uh, it is, yes. So it's completely general. Because the arguments we gave why it works better than the lower form is that like, 
like Bobo Chowdhury and Bobo Bender, it is a special case. Yeah. This is a general. So, so Chang will work better if there's a way to 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 do it better. But but that way is always. But it always works. It's always general. It always gives a correct answer, and often it will be a lot better than all that. No, it doesn't, because sometimes it takes n log n in the worst case. Oh, so what we are saying is, like, on an average, it's better, but in the worst case, it's not. Many times it's better, and sometimes it's equal to the worst case. So, so it doesn't break the worst case, because its worst case is the same as the old worst case. That's all. Yeah.